welcome, good morning um, for another talk design episode, as we're calling them. Um, yeah, and we have been talking with Matt already, and you mentioned Matt um, five years ago, I think 2015, you were one of the speakers in our first ever Bangor Design Conference at the time. Um, and I, I made a point really of inviting you back to this because it's, it's the evolution of that and we've shifted it online, you know, adapting to the situation. And to be fair, there's an advantage to this because we can call on people who's quite far away and talk to us for an hour. Um, you're also a, an alumni of our course, so it's always nice to kind of bring those people back just to see where you are and I'll keep you to that. I'll speak to you again in five years um, for, for an update. Um, so I, I, I try and avoid to introduce people too much because I, I, I want to hear from you. So if you um, tell our students um, what you've been doing, maybe give us an indication of the, your roles and where you worked before, where you are now, just to kind of see your journey towards there. So thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, yes, I'll actually just start sharing my screen to cool. um, be better illustrate some of the stuff that I've been doing and hopefully um, give you a bit of insight into the processes that we go through, um, some of the projects I've been working on and what I find like really exciting at the moment. Um, so I'll just go full screen on this, hopefully. Can everyone still see that full screen? I know sometimes there's this, okay, I'm getting a few nods and yeah. thumbs up. Okay, cool. So, um, hi everyone, I'm Matt. Um, I, as Prada said, I started at Bangor University on the product design course. And over the last 10 years, I've uh, worked at, um, at Unilever in the FMCG packaging industry, started moving through into some electronic devices there. So I was at Unilever for three or four years and I believe some of your other speakers um, I, are all, have also been from Unilever um, and then I left Unilever and moved over to a company called Pentland which many people won't know um, but they are the company that own some pretty well-known brands like Canterbury the rugby brand Speedo the swimming brand Endura for any keen cyclists um, they, they own Endura and Berghaus for any kind of keen mountaineers so I joined the innovation team which was a centralized innovation team looking at building new products and new services for each of those brands. And then most recently, I've moved across to Founders Factory, who are a London based startup studio. So we design startups and I'll talk a little bit about what that what that means and give you some insight into that. Just to bring this to life a little bit, um, I started plotting some of the products that I've been involved with over the years. So at Unilever, you can like recognize a number of those products from your local supermarket shelf, um, from the personal bottles through to um, some electronic devices, which is that Domestos product there in the, in the background, um, working on some like refill projects, which is that um, kind of line drawing there, which is actually from the patent document because we awarded a patent for that design. And then over time, what I started doing was moving from the core product design skills of sketching, spending hundreds of thousands of hours on, on CAD, building prototypes, started moving through into building electronic products. And then when I started moving to Penland, I started then looking at how we could then build apps and software that started to power some of the products. Um, so, I worked on like a connected devices project with Samsung. I launched um, an Apple iPhone app that like scan, like scanned your face and I built that from the ground up. Um, I also built a like the world leading pair of swimming goggles that was actually custom designed to an individual's face. So built an iPhone app that scanned the unique measurements of your face, built a design that automatically adapted to that face scan and then connected to a 3D printing manufacturer in Belgium that produced that unique file, assembled it and shipped it back to the customer. So that was a huge project. And then towards the end of my time at Pentland, Pentland really wanted to start developing their own new brands. Typically they would acquire brands and help them to grow, but they wanted to start building their own brands. And um, so I found it really interesting how like through my career, I've gone from like 
designing the product to designing the software and the product to designing the product, the software and the supply chain around the product. And then I started designing like businesses that each have supply chains, software and products. <laughs> so it's just kind of like um, the breadth of expertise has kind of increased over time for me. So I started launching a few brands, um, one of which is called Footprints, uh, which is a kid's shoe brand using foot scanning. Um, and then I launched my own business on the side of work that looked at uh, clothes rental and how we could enable people to travel without taking baggage anywhere. So that was really the kind of start of my entrepreneurial journey. And when I moved across the Founders Factory and the sort of thing that I'm doing now is uh, still using those same design methodologies and a lot of design thinking, but actually using that to like figure out what business it like to design a business um so some of the stuff that i've been doing recently is i created an idea for software for tours and activities um which we invested two hundred fifty thousand pounds in and now is running as a business um i designed a business that opens up personalized nutrition so only a small percentage of people can afford to go to nutritionists and get expert advice on what they're eating. Um, so we designed a service that would make it dramatically cheaper and allow every single one of you to access that, that expertise and become healthier. So we launched that. And one of the other businesses that I've built is around um, software for small brands to build their supply chain. Um, because uh, like, quite interestingly at the moment, small brands are stealing market share from big brands at about two percent a year and that's because we all want to buy from smaller brands they better cater to our individual needs than large um fmcg brands so but one thing that the small brands really struggle with is like piecing together their supply chain so and like and what i mean by that is like who's going to manufacture their product like where does it get shipped to which warehouse does it sit in how does it end up going to the retailer like which retailers does it go to which customers go to those retailers and that kind of mapping that journey is actually really complex for small brands um, so we built some software to help them with that so yeah like over time it's kind of gone from the core product design experience right through to like the, like becoming an entrepreneur for building new startups and that I, hope, I, I think we'll talk about it a little bit later on, but actually the process and methodology across all of those is quite similar. Cool, thank you. Wow, that, that's a, a great broad range of stuff. And I think you've been quite busy over, over the last year. Yeah. <laughs> um, but obviously, you're, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a drive there and th there's an interest there as well. Um, I, I don't know, I'd like to dive a bit deeper in the Founders Factory um, because it's probably a model which our students are not, might not be aware of or wouldn't necessarily come across. So who would, who would approach the Founders Factory and what would they ask you for? And then what's the process then? Because I, I take it it's coming up with new businesses and ideas essentially, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Um, a few slides I prepared earlier. So th this is this is what this is what we do at Founders Factory. We build startups from scratch, and so anyone can come to us, and we will help you to build a startup. Um, typically, the the so the way it works is that people come to us, we help help them to build startups. On on the other side of that, like we have investors and company like large corporates that want to better innovate they want to um, disrupt their market and they want to continue being leaders in their market so for example some of our partners and investors in founders factory are gmg ventures which are the invention uh, the investor arm of the guardian and um, newspaper uh, l'oreal we work with m s we work with Record Bankiza, we work with EasyJet. We also have like deep tech investors like CSC that you can see there on the bottom left. Um, so we have a range of partners and actually the range of partners is, is growing. And all of these companies come to us for new ideas of businesses, um, have like 
and really they see us as an investment. So they invest in Founders Factory. We build amazing startups that hopefully return on, on their investment. So yeah, we're, we're really, um, imagine a design consultancy, but instead of designing products, we're designing businesses. Wow, so I'm kind of also interested in how much, because um, it, it seems quite exciting. You've got, you know, investors that, that kind of money, which it, which might some startups struggle with, you know, getting that investment. It seems like it's, it's there already um, with your guys. Um, I kind of understand you, you've got some autonomy in terms of which way that you might propose a business. Um, so is it, do you propose the segments that the companies should be investing in or do they come to you with an idea, we actually now need to go into tech and do something in that area or is it a conversation and how, how does that evolve? Yeah, it really um, it really varies actually acro across these different 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 partners um some of them will will come to us and say hey like we obviously have a huge uh depth of knowledge within beauty but actually we're not particularly um like our area of expertise isn't in technology like how do you think that technology is going to change beauty in the future and therefore where should we be investing and so they'll come to us with that question and we can make recommendations. Um, so yeah, it, it kind of like, and whereas some of them really know exactly where they want to invest and build new businesses in, um, but yeah, it, it, it really depends on a on a case by case basis. But yeah, we see both ends of the spectrum. And how um, how risk averse or how open are these big businesses to take that punt on something that can they do it without negative? Um, connotations on their brand is it kind of a testing ground for them in some ways yeah so um one of the big benefits of uh companies like l'oreal investing in founders factory is um that they can trial and test and um build businesses that they wouldn't necessarily build by themselves because of the risk to their brand so all of the startups that are created are actually individually they, they're, they're businesses in their own right. They're, they're not owned by L'Oreal or one of the partners. They Those partners just simply invest in them. So it means that there's a greater degree of autonomy for those startups and they can they can try things that the, the partners can try themselves. So actually they're, they're not risk averse. I, I have experienced working in large organizations that like are on the other side of it, where there is brand reputation at stake, they are more risk averse, um, but when when we're looking on the startup side, uh, they're, they're willing to take much bigger and bolder and more creative bets. So yeah, exciting place to be. Cool. Um, so part of bringing you here really is to be a bit nosy really to find out actually what goes on. So um, yeah. is there a, I, I take it as there's a lot of design thinking methodologies and stuff that, you, that you're using and utilizing. Is there like a found, oh, here we go, a founder's factory method um, that you could share or is it something unique or is it just a common approach that you've, you know, used well? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, th I think actually, um, I, th I think we, we like to pretend that there's a, a, a secret source, but I think a lot, a lot of it is, just classic design thinking, like the diagram in the top right, you will all be totally familiar with around like discover, define, develop, deliver, and then just continue to evolve. And it's that that iterative process. Basically, that that's exactly what we do as well, although we have slightly different names that make more sense for us. So right from the beginning of the project, say if a um, a large corporate comes to us and they want to understand what businesses they should be building within the travel sector we kind of need to narrow that down right to try and understand like wh where specifically within this industry do we think that we should focus and a lot of that is really looking at like what is the way that the industry is moving what are the latest trends where what's the market size for these different segments and um we'd normally come up with like three or four different sub areas of an industry so for instance within travel it might be um tours and activities 
because you know we, we see dramatic growth from the existing players like Airbnb, Viator, Bucking.com, that sort of thing. Um, it might be tours and activities, or it might be um, focusing on families, or it might be importantly like focusing on staycations <laughs> because of government lockdowns. So um, th they would be examples of like sub areas that we would focus on. And then we'd start to go through into a discover phase where it's like, okay, so what are the problems? What, who are the people that are underserved in staycations? Like, why don't more people take staycations? Is it because like, actually it's sometimes simpler to take a flight to Malaga than it is to get your family to the outskirts of Devon? Like, it, like what are the problems that we can solve within that industry? And then we'd move through into generate. So it's like classic ideation, um, get everyone together in a room, yeah, we're keeping 3M in business with loads of post-its <laughs> and just create throwing out as many different ideas as we possibly can. We'll then go down through like a narrowing, like a, yeah, like a convergent process based on how novel that idea is, the impact in the market. Um, but then we'll also do these things called challenge sessions, which actually are very brutal sessions where you have to kind of stand up in front of all of your peers and explain your idea. And then they spend the next half an hour trying to poke holes <laughs> in your idea. And the reason for that is that once you understand what the holes are, you can then work on filling the holes. Um, so we'll then run tests to check if we filled all the holes in the idea. So it might be something like, um, someone might be like, I don't believe anyone will pay for this. No, no, no one will pay for a tool that helps them go, um, um, helps make staycations easier. Um, and then we'll go away and we'll check that. We'll meet up with some, some customers. We'll run some surveys. We'll start advertising the service on Facebook to see how many people start to interact with our adverts on Facebook. And sometimes that'll work and it'll be great and we can start to build that business. And sometimes it won't and we'll have to go around again and create some fresh ideas and um, challenge those ideas again and, and test them again. So it's really that like iterative process of like discovering, generating, challenging and checking that we go through. How, um, how, sorry, can I just dive in Matt? Yeah. How do you, um, the word that I've used over the last couple of weeks really, with, especially with our first years, um, design fixation, where they get kind of fixated on one of their ideas, which they think is the right way. How, and quite yeah. often it might not be the right direction to go. So how have you, I don't know, retrained yourself or trained yourself over the last few years to possibly not get fixated? Or um, how do you know that the idea or the route is valid to go down a, a path from just your own gut feeling? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, a, it's a real balance. And actually, this is something that I've, um, I've, I struggled with at, at the beginning. And I think the way, like my biggest advice to anyone on that is like share your ideas as soon as you can with people that like would recognize a good idea, right? Because like the longer that you har like harbor it yourself, the more pressure you put on yourself for it to be the right idea. <laughs> and then you start convincing yourself that it is the right idea. And you, you just end up going down a bit of a rabbit hole. So the, the sooner that you can share and discuss your ideas the better and it is uncomfortable it's super uncomfortable no no one likes talking about their ideas because it makes them feel vulnerable but the sooner that you can do it the better and how and i think um one thing that founders factory have, have done is made it very comfortable to discuss ideas and a lot of the times like everyone agrees that they're rubbish ideas and shouldn't shouldn't be pursued um but just the fact that you can talk about those ideas does give you does give you a sense check and I think once you've spoken about ideas you typically know deep down whether it's a good idea or not even explaining it to family and, and friends you start to get a bit of a sense I, th I think the being critical of your own ideas as well and asking yourself the hard questions is um is an important part and I'm oh I listened to a podcast this morning and I'm really trying to remember the quote as it was but it's like we should be testing 
to get to the right answer rather than to prove that I'm right. And I thought that mm. was a nice, nice way to, uh, to explain it. Um, yeah, there the definitely is. Um, Cause I would say about a third of my, my role at the moment is um, research and, and looking for evidence to support an, an idea. And there is a hundred percent a confirmation bias in research. If you, yeah. if you go in with, a preconceived idea of what you're looking for you will find the evidence to support it somehow <laughs> so um yeah, tr yeah try try to um not have that confirmation bias and um, but definitely like sh sharing ideas like other people will just ask you questions that you haven't thought of and it will it will make you consider whether the idea is the best idea or not um but it's also like very energizing well, right it, if like you have a conversation with 10 people and that you end that conversation both agreeing that this is a great idea you can leave that conversation with a lot of confidence and a lot of energy um so yeah just yeah. talk to people and be self-critical and and because we're on the topic of ideas uh, when i when i talked to you a while ago um it might have been a flippant comment but you said something <laughs> like yeah I think coming up with ideas is only 1% of what I currently do, um, which, which might appear to be kind of counterintuitive if you're a designer. So what's, what's the other 99% of what you do then, Matt, if it's not ideas? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I actually love this quote. And I, I, gen, I genuinely do believe that the ideas for whether they're product ideas or business ideas, the ideas themselves are, are pretty cheap and it's, easy, it's relatively easy to create an idea. So an example of that would be like, oh, hey guys, like why don't we create Airbnb, but instead of for houses, for cars, right? So like you can, um, you can rent other people's cars by the hour, by the day, and yeah, like people spend more on car rentals than they do on like house rentals and all that sort of stuff. So it's like, okay, yeah, so that sound, sounds great. So actually the idea there is like really quite easy to like come across. But the difference between having that idea and building, like launching that product, launching that business and it being successful is like that is the other 99%. So that would involve like who's making this product, who are your suppliers, what is the business model, how are you acquiring customers? Like how as you start to grow the business, it's like who do you hire? How do you manage your team? How do you get investment? Like all of this sort of stuff is the other 99%, which means that actually the ideas themselves are very easy to throw out and and it would be very easy for any of us to look at uh, Choro, who are Airbnb for cars, after they have raised nearly $500 million worth of venture capital money. And any one of us could sit back and say, oh, I, I, I actually, I had that idea for Airbnb for cars. But it's the difference between like what throwing up that idea and then seeing it through execution is the other 99%. And that is where it gets really hard you're faced with compromises and challenges that you can't you can't foresee um and so so that that is the other 99 percent um and it's that that's exciting right so in a way it kind of brings me back as well it, your your skill set if you look back at your career and where your you know your experience industrial placements when you were a uni and uni leaver and how when you've changed jobs and, and kind of gone up a level, so to speak, um, your designing skills have essentially, you know, the hard skills are still there. But have, have you felt yourself having to develop much more of a kind of um, the soft skills and the strategic approach rather than just designing a product which functions well and looks nice? Yeah, for, for sure. I think um, one, one thing that I... I realized was that the, although the, the hard skills like the sketching, the CAD um, were really, really important at the beginning of my career and helped me to land my first job. And in fact, the, the placement that I did while I was at uni, I, um, I actually interned at Unilever in the packaging team. And I, 
that led to my first job and I was there for four years and learned a lot. So I think it's a great kind of springboard. But I think the, the biggest things that have really impacted my career is realizing that being trained as a designer wasn't really just about improving sketching skills or CAD skills. It was really about teaching people to think differently. And if you can think differently and look at, almost look at products in a way that you say, okay, well, what's missing here? How could this be better? Or like look at businesses and say, what's missing here? What could be better? Or even look at industries and be like, okay, well, the industry is shifting in this way. What does that mean for businesses and products and the future of like how people are going to consume things? I think if you can learn how to think differently and have a unconventional view on something that that is super super valuable and that, that over my career so far that is the skill that actually i think has yielded the most value um so far and that, that did start at, at banger with the schemes like enterprise by design which i don't know whether you guys still do um but it was an amazing scheme at the time which actually taught me that I wanted to become an entrepreneur so um yeah th those sort of like thinking differently obviously nail the sketching nail the CAD like nail the hard skills but the ability to think differently I think is like phenomenal also um building stuff like I I, I actually joined back at university because of the ability to access the workshop and build prototypes and test things super, super fast. And that's exactly what I do now. It's just like, I don't walk down to the workshop anymore. I'm building, building code, but it's like the principle is exact, exactly the same. Um, so yeah, just build stuff, think differently, but yeah, nail, nail the hard skills because it'll help you to get onto the ladder. Thank you again, Matt. Um, great insights. Um, you, you kind of mentioned something there, and I think I'll, I'll, we've had loads of questions coming in, so <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, open, I'll open the floor after this. But um, you mentioned something about kind of innovation and looking towards the, the, the future. Um, because you're in that area, really, um, what, um, what do you see the future looking like in terms of innovation, consumer trends, and also thinking that the students that we've got now um, what should they be thinking that the, the direction of the industry in, is shifting to so they can better prepare themselves, really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, th this, um, I think I said it five years ago, but like this is a really interesting time to be a designer, right? Because one of the big things that I see is that plastic is, is going to become much more expensive than it is today, right? Because regulation is going to step in and start charging levies on big brands that are using uh, single-use plastics especially with biden as as president so it gets really interesting when you start to think about like okay so what are the second order effects of plastic getting more expensive how is that going to impact the designs that are created things like, like single-use packaging will in, in my mind uh, not not really exist in like or be much more expensive in like five to ten years time there'll be a shift towards more durable products there'll be a shift towards more products that have either like multiple purposes or are more connected and smarter so that actually they the, the kind of they better use the the physical materials um so I, th I think that's a really interesting, and I'd challenge everyone to think like, okay, if, if we believe that packaging, or if we believe that plastic is gonna get dramatically more expensive because of regulation, what does that mean for industries? And what does that mean for the products that, that we create, right? Um, so that, that's one. I When I was at Pentland, I, I saw a, quite an interesting movement within product design. And that was this area that's called generative design. And it's how software and 3D design are blurring to the point where um, it like the actual design that's ended up being created is kind of like a combination of like human skill using CAD software, 
but also like the algorithms that you create. So for instance, there's bits of generative design that could automatically say if you were designing, I don't know, like a bracket to like hold two beams together, you could, you could program the software to say, I need this beam to be, I need this bracket to be strong enough to hold this amount of load that pulses up and down like this. It can't be any bigger than this. It can only use like hundred grams worth of material. You'd click go and it will like start to automatically design that part in the most efficient way. And I think that is a, for anyone that's really into 3D design and CAD, SolidWorks, Siemens NX, anything like that, I would, I would encourage you to look at um, generative design because I think the future of 3D design is gonna continuously be more like part human, part algorithm that comes together to meet the best best solution. So yeah, check that out, super, super interesting. Um, but yeah, I think that they're the two that are top of mind that are most relevant. Oh no, sorry, <laughs> there is a third. All, all good things coming free. So the third is really, and I guess it's connected to the first one, but I think there will be less and less products that don't involve either being connected in some way or involve like a big business model change or involve a big marketing change. I think like product innovation as its own like product innovation will have to be combined with like business innovation or it'll have to be combined with like intelligent software. It'll, it'll have to be, it'll be bigger than just like the, having the best product. It will be like on the best business model with the best marketing strategy, with the best um, technology. So I think design is going to become more and more multidisciplinary where you will be one member of a team that's working with amazing business people, amazing marketeers, amazing supply chain experts, because it will have to become more and more, um, to be more disruptive in the industry. You can't, you can't necessarily just innovate on product. You would have to innovate maybe as, as an entire business, which involves all of those disciplines. Does that so yeah, mean more, that, more multidisciplinary. Does, does that mean that only the big boys, the people that can afford it are going to be successful or is it only the small and quick moving and agile businesses can actually survive. It, it, or it... Yeah, there, there's a reason that I work in startups and it's because <laughs> I believe that it's uh, the nimble, fast, intelligent teams of five or less that, that can really compete. I mean, it, throughout my career, I've moved from some of the biggest companies that employ more people in small countries um, to now working in a team of five and um, over the next couple of weeks I might actually join as the second employee on one of the startups so it's like it's the small teams of people that are driven smart and with a diverse range of skills that will disrupt this industry for sure um, yeah I have, no, I have no doubt in that thank you Matt right I'm gonna open up to the floor Simon do, do you want to ask your question yourself and if you do Pop the camera on, please, just so we can. You had a question about percentages or something. Is it still here? Yeah. Uh, hi. So, uh -huh. hey. It's a bit of a more morbid question, but what percentage of startups actually end up getting turned away for when their idea you have to say to them that this physically cannot work? Oh, percentage terms. Oh, so it's um, it it is it is quite tough. So typically, um, we'll end up investing in like one in fifty, one in a hundred. But there are things that you can do to like put the odds in your favour. It's not a complete game of chance, right? There are certain things that we'd be looking for around like is there a big enough market size. Is the idea novel enough? Has it? Have you spoken to enough customers that give us confidence that this is a, a good idea? So there's things like that that you can do to improve your chances. And that typically like, we'll maybe invest in one in a hundred 
of people just like approaching us but actually the further down the journey you get the better the odds become so we'll invest a small amount at the beginning and then it like uh, one in five of those will get further investment and we actually invest in uh, we have invest in a lot of different startups because we also recognize that maybe like one in 10 of them is going to become absolutely huge. One of that, one in 10 of them is going to become the next Airbnb. There will be maybe five or six out of the 10 that, that become good businesses. And then there'll be like three or four of them that do fail and don't, don't go anywhere. But then the whole SIP ecosystem of venture capital works because there is that one out of 10 that, that make it big um so yeah i mean the the odds are of getting investment at this sort of level are are pretty pretty low it's like well one in a hundred but there are things that like great entrepreneurs and if you wanted to become an entrepreneur like i'd have to spend some time with you and talk through this but um yeah there are things that you can do to increase those odds for sure um, I'm going to be nosy now. You mentioned that you, you kind of invest a small amount at the beginning. So what is a small amount, amount <laughs> to a founder's factory startup? Uh, yeah, so uh, a, small, a small amount is, um, well, typically we'll spend three months up front before we go to an investment decision, um, working on that business and getting the confidence that we should invest. So I guess that that's the, so um the, the salary of the people is like the first small investment yeah um but then at that first stage gate uh, we'll invest the first tranche of a hundred thousand yeah. and then six to twelve months later there's an other there's a subsequent 150 thousand investment um but then our ambition is that as the businesses grow they then move on to uh, attract investment of two to three to five million and then onwards um but for us to invest in a in a startup even at the beginning stages we have to be confident that it's going to be worth over a million um because we are investing two hundred fifty thousand pounds for a quarter of the business so we have to make sure that um it's going to be valued at over a million yeah well um thank you um daniel lambert he's got a couple of questions so you're gonna have to pick one <laughs> that it's absolutely fine. Uh, don't worry about it. It's, as, as you're speaking, more questions come into my mind. And like, okay, now I want to ask that one. Now I want to ask that one. <laughs> um, well, right. Because I have to be dis uh, decidey, i I'm going to focus on what I'm not asked. You mentioned, basically, you make small bets. Lots of small bets, maybe. Um, it's something I appreciate because I've done a bit of sports gambling in the past. So, <laughs> so you say you, one of the things you do is go to Facebook and use Facebook advertising, which makes sense. How fleshed out is an idea at that point? Like, is yeah, it is it a small true. bet at that point? Because you need to, I guess you need to be, something needs to be there for the customers to interact with, but it's not a full business at that point, I'm guessing. So. Yeah, for sure. Let, let, yeah, let, let me show you. Um, okay, right. Um, so this, the, 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 I can I cannot claim that this is this this is my work. This is uh, one of one of my colleagues, um, but it's an example that, that we use a lot to bring it to life. And um, so let, let me just skip back to the beginning so you kind of know what the business is. Um, so the idea here was it, this was a travel business, and we were playing with the idea of like would people um, sign up for subscriptions to pay for their holidays, so they would get free trips a year for fifty pounds a month. And their actual destination of where they were traveling to was only released um, a couple of weeks before they were traveling. And so we started mapping out what the features of the business are, creating like a little brochure. And you can see some of the slides here. Come on, please. And then what we do is start to create like really simple websites to explain this idea, like a landing page, typically using software like Webflow or Wix, or um, some of them are built on Shopify, but it's just a basic online presence to communicate to the customer what, what the idea for the business is. And then we'll use Facebook 
as an advertising platform to advertise that, that proposition to customers. And what you can start to get from that is it's actually a live indication of how many, how many people are interested in that proposition enough to click through on that ad, to engage with the site, to sign up to a waiting list, um, even like start to build a profile on your website. And that they are all like great indicators to say, like, okay, we've got something here that people are interested in enough in order to interact with the business. So, and you can start to see from on the Facebook analytics side, you can start to see, okay, well, 1,000 people saw it, 100 people then clicked on our advert. Of those 100 people that came through to our site, maybe 20 of those signed up to a mailing list. And you, you can start to like understand, okay, well, therefore, if like it's going to cost us about five pounds to attract a customer, they're signing up at 50 pounds a month. Like, it, it, does this business model start to like make sense? So that this were this sort of testing is all in that first three months. So they, they, these are like really quite small bets, um, spending um, less than a hundred pounds on on this to try and just get some confidence um, pre investment. But yeah, we typically present these sorts of results at an investment decision as well to let the investors know that you know it's a good idea that people are resonating with. So. Oh yeah, in fact, in, in this exact um, example, they actually sold free pack like to free customers before investing in the business. So it was kind of like an even better indicator that you know this was a valuable concept for people. Uh, it's genius. I love it. I love the I love the concept of just uh, doing lots of small bets and and getting that that big one with just a little investment. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Really cool. Thank you. But that, so. that also answers a question I didn't really get to ask, answer, ask really, but what does testing look like within you? And I think that, that is a perfectly framed um, response, really. Um, and yeah, brilliant. Um, right, I'm aware of the time. Uh, Jack, Jack, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure thing. Um, I was just kind of basically with, with the kind of startup of your own entrepreneurship and the team that you work with, I want to know with regards to obviously you're booking more and more clients, you're having more and more workload come in with the more people that sign up for this. Um, I want to know basically how your team manage a workload of that capacity. Yeah, this is, this is a great, great question. And honestly, I don't think I've nailed it <laughs> because <laughs> the, um, like it, it's, it's really, it's really hard, right? Like there, there's a couple of things in the mix here that, and I guess going back to what we were talking about before is that fundamentally you, you want to, you want to make sure that you're working on the most impactful thing <laughs> and the thing that's going to make the biggest difference. But fundamentally people have different opinions about what is <laughs> the most impactful thing. Um, so yeah, I, honestly, I, I think we, we've tried loads of things to like map each of these projects, map each of these tests, map each of these like even when I was um, back at Pentland and managing a team of designers and engineers we started prioritizing the features that we were building by impact to the customer time to delivery that sort of thing um, and all of those tools can can help you but honestly I I, I don't feel as though I've um, I, I've, I've nailed exactly how to manage this this workload but there, there are quite a few of those kind of almost structures and frameworks that can help you make decisions about where to focus yeah um, but they are all based on kind of subjective like we believe that's going to be a bigger impact we believe that's going to take this time but like and it can help you get a rough prioritization but um yeah i i don't think i've totally nailed it to be honest no, i think i think that's a fair fair answer to be fair i mean it's you know with, with a company with working with companies that big i suppose there's a lot of pressure behind that as well yeah yeah L luckily they um invest in founders factory at, at a bit of a distance so right. they, they want to encourage that you know we have the autonomy to like look at things that they wouldn't look at so they're not kind of breathing down our necks but um there, there are certain deadlines a, and when you get when you get close to that the pressure does the pressure does build um, i appreciate I, that thank you I, I think he was looking for a magic answer because 
our first days yeah. have been presenting yesterday and today, and they've got a deadline for 8 p.m. tonight. Um, and somebody just told me once, and I don't want to really swear on this, it's just just do the work, stop procrastinating credit, <laughs> just get on with it. And I'm like, yeah, okay, that, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> stop. But I, I definitely would say, like, um almost just spend 10 minutes thinking about what is the thing the one thing that you can do that's going to make the biggest impact mm. and then just go hard at that um and yeah just yeah as i said do, do the work and I, I i find myself sometimes i'm just busy being busy not actually getting anything done but it's just i'm doing i'm, I'm doing something which means i'm working but really mm. it's not so and then it's like ah, oh, it's a late late night so when you actually gotta commit to something um, so any, any last questions, people, or if not, we'll, um, favorite interview question, favorite user interview question, oh, favorite user interview question. The, one, the one that you go to, cause you know, you're always going to get a good answer. It's your, it's your first one or one of the first ones. Um, one question that I love to ask which is maybe like a little further down the line is like, why hasn't, why, why hasn't someone done this before? And it, it always yields a, an interesting answer. Um, and you, you get like really under the, cause I, a lot of ideas kind of become obvious once you've got the idea right. Mm -hmm. And then if you ask like, why hasn't this been done before to someone that like knows that it, maybe it's more on a neck if you're talking to an expert in the space and um, why hasn't this been done before? Then you get to like the real nut of the problem. Uh, that that's a really interesting one. Um, on the user side, oh god, I think there's just like there's a general kind of like what do you struggle with the most? What are your biggest problems? What have you tried to do to solve these problems that hasn't worked very well? And if you've got like, because typically you're, if you're if you find that someone's really struggling with a problem but they haven't really tried anything to solve it then it kind of, you need to reflect back on the problem and be like, is, is, that, is that a real problem for that person? Uh, typically the best problems are ones that people are like, yeah, this is like really annoying, really painful. And actually like, I tried to do this, it's built in an Excel sheet or like I do this calculation on the back of a napkin and I always get it wrong. Like they're the sorts of things that you should step in and be like, okay, actually that, that's a genuine problem. I'm gonna create a solution for it. Um, but yeah, so like a focus on problems and uh, like also the alternatives that people are, uh, are looking at. So, yeah. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Thank, thanks for letting me sneak a second one in. Second one. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> cool. Well, Matt, um, on behalf of myself, Dewey, and all of our students, really, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Um, but also, <laughs> but more so, thank you very much for your insights and your um, honesty and giving us a little um, peek into your life over there um so thank you very much yeah thank abs you. absolutely no no worries and the uh, the questions are great so like actually if if anyone wants to follow on with these questions they want to like build a startup or they just want to like chat <laughs> um i don't i don't leave the flat nowadays so any <laughs> social interaction is like absolutely appreciated so this is my email address email me um take a little screenshot on your phone or whatever now um but yeah just let me know and we can we can chat about stuff but so, yeah thanks for having me so basically thanks, help Matt. help thanks, Matt, Matt out in the in the lockdown <laughs> right yeah I'll, yeah yeah I'll, bit I'll, of uh, social sanity <laughs> would be amazing right i'm going to stop recording